Ah, oh, good day, mate. Forty here. So, haven't done any videos or done any blogging for eight days because uh, I assume I had COVID, and I don't know about normal people. I think this is the third time that that uh, I, I've had COVID. But when when I'm sick, like the last thing I want to do is figure out how to get tested or go to a doctor or anything like that. I just want to like lie in bed. And so that's pretty much what I've done. Like I, I've met my, yeah, my my minimal obligations. I met my obligations as a twelve step sponsor. I didn't cancel any of my appointments with my sponsees. I, I met work obligations, stuff that I was able to just do, do from home. Uh, and I uh, did some minimal cleaning, but pretty much aside from that, I just blew off every other obligation or I didn't even want to talk to people so I'm, I'm kind of impressed that most people with COVID that they you know go out and go to the bother of getting tested but I didn't want to I've got a rapid antigen test here I just I was so sick I just didn't want to figure out how to use it I had, I had so little bandwidth like I just wanted to use my bandwidth to to meet my my you know, most pressing obligations and then just let everything else go. And it's kind of a state of nihilism that, you, that I go into anyway when I get sick. Not 100% not nihilism in that I made sure that I still met my, my 12 state obli obligations as a sponsor, not out of my altruistic concern for my sponsees, but because I knew that would be good for me. <laughs> I knew that I would feel better if I was actively engaged in being helpful to other people, that that would give me a sense of, of meaning and purpose and, and strength. That, that, that talking to sponsees and talking to them about their you know, compulsions and sharing about my own compulsions and addictions, that, that, would, that would help me. Uh, so I wasn't a complete nihilist, but I would say that overall the intensity of my beliefs, you know, probably dropped to about five or ten percent of what they are normally. So, I mean, I, I still believed in God, like all, all through the illness, but I wasn't praying constantly to God. I, I, God's honest truth, I wasn't thinking about God that much when I was sick. I wasn't thinking about Torah. I wasn't even thinking that much about the twelve steps. Just you know, my, my basic obligations to my sponsees was about all the, the thinking I did about the, the 12 steps for spiritual practices. I did some, uh, did maybe five, 10 minutes of meditation a day. Uh, I tried to keep certain things, you know, reasonably clean while I was sick, but I let everything else go. And I'm just kind of thinking about that now at 3 a.m. that uh, there is a there's a productive and adaptive use of illness and and or akin to sadness or, or depression in that you let go of everything that you used to believe in, right? It's really hard to maintain intense commitment and intense belief when you're quite sick. Like my, my throat was like this, you know, a desert. It was just so painful. Like I, I didn't even want to talk. My, my throat hurt so much for about six days. And so it's, it's good to like, I got out of, you know, producing any content, right? I, I didn't make any videos for the last eight days. I didn't make any blog posts for the last eight days. I, I think I made two tweets uh, over the course of eight days. So I kind of let go of everything I believed about the world. I let go of almost everything I believed about reality, and I just existed. And uh, it's it's useful. It's really adaptive to take that pause, like to step away from producing and to step away in large part from believing in anything. I was just so wiped out that uh, I couldn't even maintain commitment to watching any particular movie or TV program. I, I try to distract myself by watching a, a movie or a TV program, and I couldn't even commit to that. I, I just like alternate between different shows. Intensity of what beliefs? Okay, so I believe in God, but 
the intensity of my belief in God significantly dipped when I had COVID. Like, I was just miserable. All right. Um, I, I have, you know, right wing political beliefs, but the intensity of my right wing political beliefs dropped to about 5% of what they, they normally are while I had COVID. Uh, I'm sure I've got you know, various cultural beliefs and uh, I've got, uh, oh, I've got beliefs about myself and you know, the contributions that I can make and that, that, you know, I have important insights to share and, uh, and, and, the intensity of those beliefs just, you know, basically dropped away to zero for, for the eight days. Now, I'm not on any psychotropic drugs. Uh, haven't been on any uh, psychotropic drugs since 2009. So, like, how do you know if your wrist is healthy, right? Because it does the things that you need your wrist to do. It picks up a pen, it can you know, pick up my glasses. You know, pick up a spinner. Claire Cole says, if you believe in God, you would do the right thing without hesitation. That's absolute nonsense, right? Yeah. Uh, absolute nonsense, all right? There's absolutely no empirical difference between uh, the behavior of people who believe in God and the people who don't, except for the people who believe in God have more in, little stronger in-group identity. But there's just absolutely no empirical basis for the things that you're saying. Now, I understand that's your faith statement, just like some people believe in aliens and other people believe that we're really being controlled by lizard people and you believe that if you believe in God, then you do the right thing without hesitation. But it's, it's, it has as much validity as, as belief in uh, lizard people. I mean, I know so many of my sponsees believe in God. And they've been absolutely addicted to drugs, to alcohol, to sex, to pornography, to debting, to under-earning, to all sorts of emotional compulsions. So there's absolutely no connection between believing in God and doing the right thing. Right? People can believe in God or in lizard people till the cows come home. doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do the right thing. Or that they'll even come even closer to doing the right thing, or that they'll even be any more likely to do the right thing than atheists or agnostics. There are people who claim to believe in God, and there are people who actually believe in God. Yeah, but there's no empirical way of uh, finding a difference between them. So it's a, uh, it's just a coping mechanism that people who believe in God and who believe that people believe in God uh, have the strength and the knowledge to do the right thing. Uh, it's a coping mechanism for trying to account for why, in reality, there's no evidence that people who believe in God act in a superior fashion on a consistent basis than people who don't believe in God. So you have to have some kind of coping mechanism. So you come up with, oh, my God, if you, uh, if only you like really believed in God, and if you, if you say you believe in God but you're doing the wrong thing, then they're, they're just you know, then you must not really believe in God. Like, that's just a coping mechanism. So, the volume's too low. Yeah, I'm not going to boom out my voice at uh, 3.21 a.m. All right. Yeah, do, do people who have dogs, speaking of that, do people who have dogs have any consideration for their neighbors? Like, do you know how annoying it is to have a yapping, barking dog next door? I mean, and like having a live streamer next door at 3.21 a.m. who's like booming their voice out, I, I can't imagine that that would be a lot of fun either. So, yeah, I try to have consideration for other people, whether I have an incredibly intense belief in God at that moment or I don't have any belief in God at that moment. Just for my own welfare, I prefer to have uh, some consideration for other people and the effects of, of my behavior and my speaking have on them. I have no desire to wake up people around me uh, just so that I could have stronger voice quality on, on a live stream. <laughs> Atheists and nihilists who have no principles, there's no empirical uh, basis for, for seeing that, right? Uh, Atheists raise children about as well as uh, believers in God, right? Most Americans believe in God, and uh, this belief in God is, is a mile wide and an inch deep. And you just don't see any empirical difference between people who believe in God and people who don't believe in God, generally speaking.
people who have religious principles would defend their religious pe- principles, wouldn't they? <sighs> Claire, you, you're taking people as though what they say about themselves, that's what's true, right? People generally speaking, are religious for social reasons. It's the way they've been socialized. It's the way they've been habituated. It's where their friends are. And it's the way to socially signal that you're a good person in some circumstances. Okay. For every 100 religious people, you'll have about one person who has a deep understanding of their religion and uh, can can enunciate the you know, major theological and philosophical underpinnings of, of their religion. Just like for every you know 100 people who ostensibly have some interest in politics, uh, probably fewer than five percent have any kind of coherent worldview. So it's like thinking that the war in Ireland between. Uh, the, the Protestants and the Catholics is primarily a religious dispute. You always hear it's like, oh, it's you know the Catholics versus the Protestants, but they're not, they're not divided by the finer points of Christian theology. They're just two different groups, and religion is the uniform that uh, distinguishes the groups, but religion's not the basis for the actual fighting. <coughs> but anyway, I. I Going back to, all right, your, your, your wrist is working, all right, if it does the things that you'd want your wrist to do. So my wrist work. I have no problems with my wrist. My wrists have no, no pain. Um, and so my, my wrist is, is adaptive, right, because it, it does everything it needs to do. So, too, with, uh, with, with your beliefs, right, your beliefs are adaptive if they make you happy and make you... Um, a pro-social person and they enable you to do the things that you want to do then then your beliefs are adaptive and so too with your emotions like i think going through you know a crushing experience like like covid if you've got a severe case so i'd say that mine was like a seven out of ten so i was able to work from home uh, i was able to meet my minimal obligations i was able to meet my obligations of 12 step sponsor and that was it for for eight days Uh, so other than that I was just in retirement I just there was nothing almost nothing that I believed in beyond that right Uh, I had some light belief in God and in in commitment to my my 12 steps once he's but other than that like Donald Trump right is his home at Mar-a-Lago is raided and I was just struck by very low intensity of my reactions so I think that's really adaptive that we that nature has has built in these mechanisms where we kind of pause and <laughs> lie back from our beliefs, all right? <coughs> I suspect most people, when they're sick, that they have a similar experience to me, that the, the intensity of their beliefs diminishes. And this is the thing that I would find uh, a good analogy to that. When I flew back to Australia November 16th, all right, I... I Go back to Australia November 17th, I think. I arrive in Australia 2021. And when I have time, I open up my laptop and I check in on the LA Times. And I I find as I'm reading the LA Times that the the, the news about what's going on in Los Angeles and California has about 5 to 10% of of the interest to me that it normally has. Like simply shifting my location and... Everything that was once important to me is pretty much considerably diminished. Right? The people who are most important to me in L.A., because they weren't around, it kind of diminished the intensity of, of that, that connection. I remember I left uh, America, I left California for a year after high school, went back to Australia, and that largely broke my sports addiction. I remember I came back to Sacramento in June of 1985 and the World Series that fall I think it, it had featured the Kansas City Royals and the St. Louis Cardinals and it was the first World Series in like seven years that I just didn't care about because being away from California or you know all my sporting uh, beliefs and attachments j- got attenuated because they didn't receive any social support 
and so too with, with being sick i just i was just struck by how i I'd, I'd step back from from all my ideological commitments and cares and, and concerns and just kind of kind of felt distanced from my life because i wasn't really participating in my life and so i think it's it's being sick in that way is kind of similar to to sadness and depression that uh, these can serve a an adaptive function because this is an opportunity to step back from the things that you do habitually and ask yourself you know are these things that i typically commit myself to and put a lot of energy into and really believe strongly about are, are they worth it like are my commitments worth it are my beliefs worth it are my practices worth it is my life how i'm living it worth it is the way i'm spending my time worth it and so with depression or illness you have that opportunity to just step back from your routine to reassess your 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 beliefs your, your practices your life your, your commitments and then to think through new possibilities new beliefs new commitments new practices and then also to work them out in in your head it's like okay after kind of the, the soul-shattering experience of a, a strong bout of, of illness you you come out of it changed and affected and uh, my dad who man my dad the, the christian preacher very strong beliefs but he would he would come out of illness with this lethargy and and a sense of you know verging on nihilism if if the illness was severe enough that that just didn't really care about anything very much like he would meet his obligations he was he was a, a good man and uh, <laughs> but he would he just didn't care as much anymore uh, Claire Coyle says I am never depressed in fact I'm rather surprised at the robustness of my mental health Yeah, it, what's uh, interesting about Claire Carr, even though she's always falling out with people, it never occurs to her that there might be something that she's done that has played a role in other people falling out with her. So, I mean, if that's if that's uh, one's vision of uh, good mental health to, to never introspect, is oh, you know, maybe there's something that I'm doing that's caused all these other people to turn away from me. Uh, she never has to, has to struggle with that kind of introspection. So, yeah, depression and, and illness and and sadness it serves it serves an adaptive function because it gets you out of your routine, it gives you distance from yourself and your life and, and your beliefs and, and your commitments, and you then have an opportunity to rethink how you want to live your life, and do you want to keep allocating your time and your passion and your resources the way you have been. And you start thinking about new ways that you want to live, and then you kind of work them out in your head. And so I think it's 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 really a healthy pause to to pause from habitual compulsive commitments and to just you know treading the the, the same path through life uh, and uh, thinking oh maybe there's a maybe there's a different way to do things. And so I was just watching this Netflix series on uh, Manti Teo who who got catfished all right he he got this uh, girlfriend but it was actually a guy who was calling him <laughs> he never actually meets his imaginary girlfriend and then when the the relationship becomes a little too intense uh, the guy kills off the the girlfriend character and uh, Manti Teo who was a linebacker at Notre Dame he looked like the biggest fool in the world. So for a while, he had like the number one feel-good sports story of the year. And, and all these sports publications were, were you know, saying what an amazing story it, that Manti had because his, his grandmother and his imaginary girlfriend uh, both died on the same day. And so Manti Teo had, I'm not phased by rejection. I mean, Claire, you are so disconnected from reality. You're incredibly upset by rejection. 
it really bothers you. You obsess about it. You can't understand it. Anyone talks to you and you'll go, oh, I don't understand why this person cut me off. I don't understand why that person cut me off. I don't understand why this person doesn't want to talk to me anymore. You're absolutely obsessed with your your rejections. <laughs> you are, you're so disconnected from reality. It's, uh, it's just uh, stunning to, to see. But uh, Manti Teo had this hero system where he was like dedicating his life to the memory of his, his like dead girlfriend who he never met and turned out didn't exist, was the, was the catfishing creation of you know, some dude. And, and so I think it's good to step back from one's hero system. And, and that naturally happens when you're either depressed or, or sick and, and, and reevaluate, you know, how real, how true is this? And, and is this helping me to be, to lead the life that I want to live? And so Mante Teo, this national football league player, like he had a hero system that worked until it didn't, until it became exposed that it was all, you know, a catfishing scheme. And in many ways, that's that's no different from other hero systems, all right? We, we all choose a, a hero system, right? Those, those who are, you know, cognitively developed. If, if you don't just simply accept the hero system that's handed down to you by society, by your family, by your community, but if you actively choose a hero system, you, you're making a leap of faith. And so it, I think it's good to step back sometimes from your leaps of faith, your leaps of commitment, and like reassess, is this real, is this true, is this good? And it's so funny in the Mante Teo story, uh, he played for Notre Dame, and there's this talk about, you know, what are our values, right? right? Football is an incredibly damaging sport. I mean, football does incredible damage to people, like, you know, cognitively damages them, physically damages them. And so these football-playing institutions th that are moralizing about the values of their institution, uh, you're an institution that destroys people. <laughs> you're, you're an institution that wrecks lives for the entertainment of, of viewers. And I enjoy the entertainment value of, of football, but come on now. I mean, obviously, you know, these, these football institutions that, that believe that they have these profound you know, value systems, it's a, a tremendous delusion. And you know, most of us probably live you know, by a considerable amount of delusion. And sometimes delusion serves you and sometimes it doesn't serve you. And how can you reassess your delusions and assess you know, whether or not they're serving you? By a good bout of illness or, or depression, right? That gives you the necessary distance from your illusions and delusions and beliefs and hero systems to think a second time about whether the whole thing's serving you. So I think maybe God even created nihilism, right? Because you know, the temporary application of, of some nihilism to your life during illness and depression, it gives you the distance to reassess often what are arbitrary and, and invented and, and delusional hero systems that one might be living by. I mean, if you listen to interviews with athletes, they're always hyping themselves up uh, with, with delusions. Like, oh, they, you know, if we win this game, they can't take it away from us. You know, they didn't respect us. I mean, the, the delusions of you know, sports fanatics and, and athletes are a legion. And to some extent, these delusions serve them, but then you see with the Mente Teo story how sometimes your delusions don't serve you. <laughs> and who's the, who's the real hero in the Mente Teo story? It's his uh, dead transgender girlfriend. You know, he, he really missed his gay dead transgender girlfriend. So while I've been sick over the past week, the only thing that's kept me going is Mente Teo's dead transgender girlfriend. I dedicate this show to her. And uh, it's interesting, he would never have been nominated for the Heisman Trophy, and he almost won the Heisman Trophy, right? The Heisman Trophy is voted on by sports writers, and they love a good story. And so he received all this acclaim and was nominated for the most prestigious award in college football 
for a completely nonsensical, delusional, you know, catfishing story where he imagined he was in, in a relationship with someone who didn't exist. So I appreciate the distance that uh, illness has, has given me from my hero systems and uh, let me see things with even greater clarity going forward. Talk to you later.